thank you, uh, Polish Astrobiology Society and everyone uh, for giving this opportunity to present here. I'm Shepshanka Palat, and along with my team at Life Twin Beyond, some of, the, some of its members, uh, we have been working on a systemic literature review on a broader theme of Venus and habitability, and obviously on subtopics related to this broader theme. I'll share it in a minute. Uh, and this particular presentation is a part of that ongoing work. Um, obviously, spectral signatures from the Venetian clouds. Uh, we'll try to uh, discuss more on the chemicals um, uh, in the Venetian clouds and more uh, related to associated anomalies um, towards that direction. And without further ado, let us begin. Uh, we very well know that uh, we'll be discussing about a very sister planet. Uh, which is not that far away, yet mysterious enough compared to any other far away planet uh, in the outside our solar system or within our solar system. And uh, if we just talk about Venus, it's obviously considered as the Earth's twin. Uh, our Earth is just a little bit uh, bigger than Venus in terms of its equatorial diameter. And when Venus is uh, quite nearer to uh, the Sun, our Earth is also a bit farther away. But then the solar intensity and the solar flux associated with Venus is quite uh, uh, greater compared to that of Earth. And also the gravity is a bit less, but the most important and the most peculiar thing about Venus are its days, which is longer compared to its year. Like if we just talk about the other planets in our solar system, our Earth just takes about 24 hours, but a solar day on Venus is 117 days. Right. And also the pressure, the surface pressure, it's 92 times than our Earth. And also the atmosphere majorly consists of carbon dioxide and many, many other components I'll be discussing. And uh, our Earth in comparison majorly consists of nitrogen and oxygen. Now, after this 101 of Venus and, uh, in comparison to our Earth, uh, it's important to note that it's quite obvious that um, Venus doesn't seem that so you can say cool enough to live, right? Or even like it, it's, it isn't uh, heaven like our Earth. It's a hostile planet. But recent work, as already discussed a bit uh, uh, by Dr. Paul uh, a few minutes uh, before, uh, it is certainly, uh, it has certainly gained interest uh, in the recent years. And I'll be discussing about some of its anomalies and what are the plausible explanations in that direction and also the astrobiological point of view and future missions. Uh, Venus, obviously, uh, the uh, the cloud layers that's around 50 to around uh, you can say 45 to 50 or 60 kilometer above the surface. That particular cloud region is the most uh, you can say um, feasible environment that is considered for life as we know it. Um, it's at least for life as we know it, for its inhabited uh, you can say habitability conditions on Venus are similar uh, to Earth uh, for life to be present. But then again, uh, with regard to the composition of the Venetian clouds, sulfur compounds, carbon dioxide, water in the form of vapor, and the temperature ranges in that particular region from 273 to 333 K and pressures between 0 0.4 to 2 atmospheric pressure. And that particular region is the most important uh, with regard to astrobiological exploration. After this introduction, I'll be just discussing a bit about the most important uh, key chemical species that have been found or like uh, that we know generally about Venus from the past missions to Venus. Obviously, carbon dioxide, as already mentioned, sulfur dioxide, sulfuric acid droplets, water in the form of water vapor, iron and some of its species, phosphorus and some of its species, and more, uh, more very recently, glycine has also been reported to be present as one of the most simplest amino acids we know to date is also uh, has is, has also been reported to be present and it makes it more interesting to think it out from an astrobiological point of view. Now coming to the anomalies that has uh, yet to get more explanations and like evidence whether some plausible explanation do fit uh, the uh, explanation for the anomalies or not. The first one is the albedo drop. Uh, we know uh, in general the albedo is the uh, fraction of the sunlight or the radiation reflected by any celestial body, mainly the planets or the moon. And generally Venus, in case of Venus, uh, though its temperature is extremely high, the fact is that it reflects off 90% uh, of the sunlight that it reaches. And that's generally around when the wavelength is in the region like more than 500 nanometer. 
And then uh, there's a gradual drop that is uh, kind of witnessed or observed uh, when the wavelength goes down to around uh, 370 nanometer. And then there is a slight increase when, it, uh, go, when the wavelength uh, goes down uh, even lesser than 370 nanometer. But then uh, when we see here that at 0 0.9, the um, wavelength, when it is uh, around, you can say more than 550 nanometer as already discussed, uh, the albedo drop, um, or you can say the reflection of the radiation is higher. And then uh, 0 0.2 to 0 0.5, the albedo drop is seen. And even like uh, the um, absorbers are more in the UV region. So generally the reflection is less, the reflecting of the radiation from the sun. So uh, in a paper, as you can see here at Jezova, uh, al., they have proposed like maybe it's the presence of sulfur dioxide or even ferric chloride that in the Venetian clouds that may result at their respective wavelength range that may result or may absorb the solar radiation so as to reduce the uh, solar radiation that gets reflected back and thereby uh, you can say uh, reducing the albedo drop. So that's the first, uh, you can say, anomaly that is yet to get an explanation that why it happens in case of Venetian clouds and what are the potential absorbers uh, in the Venetian clouds in case of the solar radiation. And then again, on that same line, in the UV absorbing layers, as we see uh, that sulfur dioxide again considered uh, the most potential species for the absorption of the solar radiation. But again, you know, like uh, majority of the uh, areas in the Venetian clouds, they have this unknown UV absorbing layers. And uh, currently this layer is basically uh, consisting of this UV absorbing aerosol composed of many other uh, components. But then uh, the potential candidates, as mentioned, the SO2 or the sulfur dioxide standalone elemental species can also be uh, considered. And also the sulfur particles or croconic acid or even like iron chloride uh, can be considered as the candidates for this sunlight uh, radiation, uh, sunlight or radiation absorption. Okay. Uh, so these, after these two anomalies, there is this third anomaly that has been reported by data uh, like from the pioneer Venus to Venus Express. Um, and that's the cloud top variation uh, in the sulfur dioxide in the Venetian clouds. Essentially, it's all about the strong latitudinal and the transient variability of the sulfur dioxide's uh, column density uh, that, is in, that is kind of consistent with the uh, supply fluctu uh, fluctuations uh, from the lower parts of the um, Venetian atmosphere. So uh, this particular data has been reported, means, as already mentioned, uh, back in uh, means from the Pioneer Venus to the Venus Express times. But there has not been any conclusive explanations or even inferences why this scout of variation of SO2 is seen or observed in the Venetian clouds. After this third anomaly, there is another. Uh, we see the presence of ammonia as well. Uh, like as uh, Dr. Paul was mentioning, like maybe we have to think in a better direction, like maybe they're, uh, you can say, agnostic biosignatures kind of like, uh, uh, but also with the fact like considering all biological mechanisms to find out uh, the, their plausible production um, as ways. But then again, there is a hypothesis that kind of says like, obviously the NH3 detection was kind of reported by Venera 8 as well as Pioneer Venus probes, but uh, it's the hypothesis stands out like this, like the NH3 neutralizes the sulfuric acid, then uh, the it gets trapped, means the SO2 in it gets trapped in the form of ammonium sulfide salt sludge. And so what happens that uh, the Venetian cloud drops, the pH is approximately uh, in that region, means it's not reported what exactly is the region, means the height from the surface uh, is, but it is almost uh, one. And mostly consists of semi-solid ammonium salt sludges. Uh, more than the pure H2SO4 um, droplets, and uh, maybe the and maybe it pro provides for a good condition for life to exist out there or sustain out there. But then uh, it is also considered the presence of NH3 out there is uncertain and maybe uh, may involve biological production, hopefully. And then as we get explanations to these, which are more or less alignment uh, with uh, the currently. Uh, present data. Uh, more testings can be done with regard to future in situ Venetian measurements and eventually these anomalies can be uh, kind of uh, provided with a conclusive explanation.
And after these four uh, anomalies, as we have discussed, there's also the astrobiological point of view uh, regarding Venus that is uh, that has quite uh, been interesting. Like as we are going back to the moon through the Artemis generation or like through other missions from across the globe, uh, obviously uh, years are coming up soon where we can say we are going back to Venus finally. Uh, like you can say the upper atmosphere and the cloud decks of uh, Venus provide for that habitable conditions. At least from a human point of view, it is quite obvious to consider that. Then obviously the detection of phosphine, one of the most, uh, you can say, um, hot topics in the recent uh, years has rejuvenated the interest about Venus and its potential habitability uh, conditions and missions towards that. And we, we, it's an honor to listen to uh, one of the pioneers in Venus research who will be presenting tomorrow as a keynote speaker in that direction. And then uh, extremophiles on Earth also, there are uh, kind of hintings like uh, potential survival in Venetian moderate cloud environments, like as mentioned previously. And there are also Earth-like conditions in the past that is suspected. And potentially Venus could have uh, kind of uh, sustain life in such temperate climates and in the presence of liquid water when that runaway greenhouse effect hadn't happened. And also studying of this Venetian geological history can also reveal more insights into habitability conditions in exoplanet, uh, which are almost similar to Venus or like has this extreme conditions. And more towards this direction, obviously the Venetian chemical anomalies uh, in the in its clouds uh, have has got many plausible explanation in studies, but eventually it's the in-situ measurements and remote measurements and conclusive evidence that can prove um, is that which explanation is right and which isn't. And uh, finally, the astrobiological potential about Venus uh, has increased a lot with uh, obviously coming up missions like the NASA's Veritas and Da Vinci Plus, as you can see here with many objectives and uh, Russian uh, Venera D mission, even India is proposing a mission by 2031 and there are a few flyby missions soon. And the most important being a very astrobiologically focused mission, the Rocket Labs mission, uh, the first private mission uh, to Venus. Uh, we'll explore more about Venetian geology, atmosphere and also potential habitability out there. And to note, obviously, the information about Venus is a bit scattered around the place. And uh, we, yes, we thought of going towards a narrative review, but then uh, we thought that a more systemic approach, given there's no systemic literature review in this direction, can obviously direct future work to some extent. And uh, we initiated this SLR a few months before and uh, following the PRISMA guidelines at the moment to focus our work on deciphering works, maybe uh, more than one uh, regarding Venetian biosignatures and also uh, its habitable conditions and missions sent to the planet to date, considering a 20 year landscape of like uh, papers uh, from, uh, from databases. And all in all, that's it. And thanks to the team members who have helped out with this work and also uh, acknowledging the efforts of those who supported this. I'm open to any questions and also any kind of positive criticism with regard to our work. Thank you very much, Polish Astrobiology Society, for organizing this wonderful conference. Looking forward to participate in other sessions. Thank you again.